Hey everyone, I'm Quartz CEO and co-founder Zach Seward, and welcome to Make Business Better, our new weekly live show right here on LinkedIn. This is uh, our second episode. Every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time, I'll, I'm talking to business leaders who are committed to making business better through their work and who could share practical advice for all of us to apply in our own lives and jobs. Today's topic is pricing things fairly and trying to engender customer loyalty uh, through through such tactics. There's a, a lot of different pricing strategies, no matter what industry you work in, I'm you know, sure you're familiar with some of, uh, some of the, the classic pricing tactics. Um, some, though, of course, start to cross uh, in across the line into you know, abusive of, of customers, and and sometimes there's just uh, unexpected effects of a pricing strategy that that uh, sort of create unfair situations. Some of which we'll talk about uh, with our guest today, who is Shay Wong, the co-founder and CEO of Boxed, uh, who's going to join us shortly to talk about that. But before uh, we get to Shay and bring him in, uh, I will start, as always, with the court's essentials on today's uh, topic of fair pricing. Even if you've never had to think about pricing in your own work, you probably remember staring at a supply and demand chart that looked something like this uh, in an economics course long ago. Uh, that point in the middle where supply and demand meet is known as the price equilibrium. And simply put, it's what customers should be charged and, for, and pay for the good. Simple, right? Of course, uh, the econo like most economic concepts, uh, it starts to break down once it meets reality. And there are a lot of other factors that end up affecting pricing, especially in e-commerce. Um, when you're shopping for holiday gifts, uh, I'm sure you're running into some of the most common tactics, uh, limited time sales, 16 people are viewing this item now by in the next two minutes. A lot of these things are now standard practices in, in e-commerce, e some of which totally legitimate ways uh, to drive business. Others, again, you know, tend to, to cross a, a, certain, uh, a certain ethical line. Um, in addition, it, it, it can be that uh, pricing strategies end up creating uh, un, unintended consequences where customers are treated unequally. And we'll, we're going to talk about one such uh, dynamic uh, in a moment, which is that uh, Overall, women tend to pay a lot more than men for very similar products, uh, and uh, it, it's, as you see here on the in the chart at the left, um, there's also there also tend to be big regional differences in pricing of goods. Uh, you know, on the as, as the chart on the right uh, shows, the very same luxury goods uh, in uh, parts of Asia are are sold at a much higher price than they are. Uh, to customers in the U.S. Uh, and across Europe, um, simply due to market dynamics uh, in those different countries, but creating what you know is arguably a, a, an unfair, unfair dynamic for the customers getting charged more. So those are the essentials. Uh, now let's bring in our guest, Shay Wong. Shay is the co-founder and CEO of Box, which is uh, disrupting the wholesale shopping club experience by enabling people to shop for bulk-sized items online or via the mobile app uh, and have them delivered directly to their door. Shay, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Zach. So before we start these interviews, I've been asking our guests to share a little bit of uh, the scene where they're coming from, because most of us have been working from home uh, these days, and it's a nice insight into you know our personal home lives uh, while we're while we're doing work. Uh, but you appear to either be using a Zoom background, uh, a very fancy one, or or actually you're at work. Uh, which is it? I am at work, uh, and so it's it's it's. It's, uh, it's good sometimes to, to come into work and uh, for us, so during the pandemic, we had this policy where we try to have at least one C staff member on site. If we tell the team it's safe to be in the building, then we should eat our own dog food and we should be in the building. So I'm here in sunny Union, New Jersey uh, at our fulfillment center. I uh, love it. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for taking the time to, uh, to join, uh, join the show while, uh, while you're there. I want to start our conversation about fair pricing with a with a really specific example. Could you tell us about the pink tax? What it is? What Boxed is doing to address it? I, this was a big announcement that the company made last year, and I, we'll get into more detail about the, the decisions you made there. But first, for our audience sake, uh, just let's let's start with the with the basics of uh, 
what is what is meant by the the pink tax? Yeah, so the pink tax is really two separate unfair taxes uh, levied upon women uh, in this country. Um, so one is legislative. So in over 30 states uh, in America today, um, women are charged uh, uh, basically a sales tax as if it's not a necessity item or if it's a luxury good item on feminine care products. So tampons, pads, and those type of products. Um, whereas in those same jurisdictions, in some of them, you'll see condoms and Rogaine are not charged sales tax because those are necessities. Um, so there's a legislative tax. Uh, there's also a societal tax uh, or brand tax where if you have a pink basketball, sometimes you'll see all these examples online where it costs $2 more than a blue basketball or a $5 extra charge on a pink razor versus a razor that's blue marketed for men um, that has the same technology in it. So there's a legislative side as well as the brand and societal side. Got it. And uh, la uh, I think about this time last year, uh, Box uh, made an announcement trying to take take on the the pink tax. Uh, what was that? Um, how are you, what are you trying to do to address uh, to, to to address those those two uh, uh, problems? With it, both the, the the actual tax, the legislated one, uh, as well as this tendency uh, to charge more for similar products uh, that women are buying. Yeah, there's only so much that we can do as a private company. Uh, so we've taken that proactive stance of saying, hey, we still have to by law collect the sales tax from you. And so if we do have to do that, then we're going to lower the price of those items in which we feel like we have to unfairly collect that sales tax from you. So as if it's the price um, or as if you're not paying sales tax. So um, if you're going to pay 8% in your state, then we're going to rebate 8% back to you. And so uh, that's what we're doing against the legislative side of things. And also on the other side of the house, um, if we don't have to collect sales tax um, or if it's just a, a, an overpriced product simply because it's pink, um, then we're going to normalize the price so that it's the same price as the male counterpart. Um, and, you know, our customers have, uh, of course, they've loved the, the kind of price discount. But now it's a top five reason uh, of why women shop with Boxed uh, now that it's gaining steam. Unfortunately, yeah. though, we're still the only national retailer in America that has taken such a stance. And... and you essentially have to eat the cost uh, as a company in order to make that make that happen. Obviously, you explained with respect to um, you know sales tax, you have to collect it either way, but also for pricing differences. So th those pricing differences tend to be insisted upon by the by the retailer. Yeah, that's right. So uh, we eat probably ninety nine percent of the cost, um, and and now it's 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 well into the seven figures. So the millions of dollars that we've rebated back to customers. Um, it's a uh, it's sometimes it's it's sometimes a hard pill to swallow, but um, uh, it was a program uh, incubated, developed by the women of Boxed. I personally didn't even know that it was uh, an issue. They brought it to me, and um, us being in the supply chain, us being in the distribution chain, uh, we just felt like we need to do something about it, and so uh, we greenlit the program. It, it obviously, determined that that cost was was worth it. But I'm curious, how, how do you go about weighing that kind of a decision? as a company where the inputs are both financial and moral con considerations. Uh, it, it, it seems like it would be difficult to put a price say on the, what is clearly an unethical practice in, uh, in e-commerce, but um, I don't know how I would, you know, what I would say is, uh, is worth spending to, in order to address uh, that. And I, I'm sure, you know, there are other examples of unfair pricing that you could take on where you'd have to make a similar kind of calculus. Yeah. So anytime we take any, uh, so if you just take all the different causes that, that, you know, that are important to the employees of Box and employees and, and our customers as well, um, we can't support all of them. Um, and so just like you mentioned that there's other kind of, uh, uh, you know, inequalities that, that we should be addressing, but you know, that we just can't go after everything or else we're going to spread ourselves pretty thin. Um, so we now think about like a Venn diagram. So, um, what do we do in our day jobs as Box? What do we distribute? What do we sell? Who are our customers um, uh, and our employees? And what are the issues that we can really uh, make change in? And so any of that overlap is kind of what we'll consider. So take the pink tax, for example. We sell a ton of feminine care products every single year. We know the manufacturers. We sell it. Our customers are primarily women. Um, it's an important issue that we can affect change in. And so we're going to take that on. But it's certainly not everything. And on your question before about how it's evolved in terms of, you know, how do we come to these decisions? Because they are, you know, they are pretty big financial hits now, now that our scale is getting larger and larger. Um, 
it's interesting because in the beginning, the finances, uh, were, when we were small, these decisions were a lot easier from a finance perspective. So it's just what we wanted to do, what we thought was right from a moral perspective. Um, what you found was that, man, with the pink tax, you look at the bill and it's like any way you cut it throughout the next few years, it's going to be a lot of money. Um, but for us, um, the good thing is that our brand and why customers shop with us um, uh, has become uh, uh, worthwhile you know, for us to uh, take part in some of these initiatives. So um, people see us as the, the anti kind of big company. People see us as the anti Death Star. Um, and so a lot of these initiatives uh, end up paying for themselves in terms of the awareness that it drives uh, to the company. Got it. Yeah, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. As I mentioned, I, I, this is one of many examples of uh, you know, pricing decisions that I have to imagine you grapple with as a CEO, trying to determine where the line ought to be. Um, these tac- there are lots of common tactics in e-commerce that are crucial for growing a business like yours, many of which are I would argue in a pretty innocuous, but but some some cross the line. And so it seems like you have to be sort of making these moral judgments uh, frequently. To use some more specific examples, uh, I'm curious, earlier this year, there was a run on toilet paper, or other household goods all across uh, the world, uh, frankly. How, how did Box handle that? Uh, did you ever consider so-called you know, surge pricing for, for toilet paper um, and, and pricing and pricing goods based on demand? Um, we, we didn't because, um, you know, a lot of these products, uh, their state, uh, one, it's, it's not the right thing to do. And two, also there's a bunch of um, uh, uh, state regulations and laws that say, you know, uh, in times of, uh, of state crises or state emergencies, you can't charge uh, above X percent of your normal kind of baseline price. Um, but when it comes to non-emergency times, certainly the technology there is there, you know, for anyone that's taken an Uber or Lyft to know that surge pricing is a thing. Uh, even if you've taken a, a flight uh, in the last kind of 15 years, you've probably paid some sort of surge pricing. But when it comes to household essentials, I feel like outside of panic buying that we're seeing again now, uh, currently, um, probably, you know, one of the less likely surge prices uh, uh, or less likely sectors to be affected by surge pricing. I just feel like it's so ubiquitous um, that uh, that uh, folks um, in general times won't find it as scarce. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Yeah, it's, it, it, Uber certainly made argument somewhat persuasively that you know what what one person might view as as uh, price gouging is is in fact just uh, uh, handling market dynamics in a, in a smart way and you're right like uh, hotels airlines have have done you know practiced the uh, so-called surge pricing forever yeah. you know one of the ways Zach, is that you know inadvertently and indirectly everyone listening to this right now is paying or probably will be paying surge pricing on anything you buy online uh, in the coming months. Um, so I'm sure you're starting to see the articles of how the transportation industry is beginning to buckle uh, because e-commerce was never meant to grow this quickly. Basically, even months ago, you saw the transportation industry uh, being in peak mode, so general holiday mode. Um, and if anyone watching this will remember, every five, every year over the last five years, there's like this story that says, oh, thousands of kids um, are disappointed around the holidays because their packages didn't show up on time. And so those are normal peak periods. And so you have the pandemic peak plus the holiday peak. It's a double peak. And so carriers all over the country can charge whatever the heck they want to move your boxes. Um, and that's just the reality of it. We have to either absorb the cost or pass it along to our customers. Um, and so it wouldn't shock me if you start to see uh, e-commerce companies really begin to pass along the cost because um, sometimes they're, they're rather substantive. Helps explain why Amazon's invested so much in building out its own infrastructure for the, that last mile delivery I, I imagine for anybody else that's just a huge a huge risk that's right uh, i'm curious uh, i'd love to do a, a quick lightning round on on other uh pricing tactics uh which is i'll start with the one that it should be pretty easy for you what do you think about charging a fee to access bulk discounts like uh some uh on competitors that shall not be named uh tend to do um i think um it can be very powerful at the same time for us, it, you know, we'll always have a free tier where you don't need a membership to access those discounts. Uh, what you're seeing though, is that 
folks actually don't mind uh, uh, paying a little bit more for a loyalty program that they can then uh, come out ahead uh, over the course of the year. And the company itself gets a, a loyalty driver. And so there could be that win-win situation. But um, for us, always there will always be a, a free uh, membership tier. Um, I, I just think there's some folks that don't want to pay the membership fee and still want to access some discounts and uh, they'll have a home here at Box. Makes sense. Uh, a slightly harder one, price anchoring. Uh, for does it, uh, at, at home, it, a very common tactic in pricing is to put something really expensive on the restaurant menu or in a catalog uh, in order to make everything else look cheap uh, by comparison. I think that this tends to be seen as a fairly innocuous tactic uh, in, in pricing strategy. Would do you uh, endorse it? Uh, it is rampant. So I actually came from the gaming industry of the, the social gaming industry where it is rampant, uh, the, you know, and, and there, there are like, there's hard data that shows it actually works that folks, you know, um, uh, uh, that all the things of like analysis, uh, paralysis by analysis, price anchoring, all those tactics work. Um, I think when it comes to retail and what we sell, um, uh, um, for better or worse, uh, I don't know if it works. I tend to think it probably doesn't work uh, or that for us, um, it's more about quality anchoring. So we have uh, a, a good product and then we'll anchor it, or that we'll anchor our selection with uh, and then we'll have a best product um, and a better product. Um, uh, or, or sorry, we'll have a better product, anchor it with a good, so middle with the better and then we'll have the best at the very top. So quality anchoring is probably how we would think about it because we are limited skew. So we'll have two to three entrants in any category, for example. There's an interesting uh, piece in the Wall Street Journal yesterday about uh, Peloton. Well, it was about a few different pricing strategies, but uh, Peloton's strategy in introducing a higher end bike um, but it is essentially what you're talking about or to doing quality anchoring, a little bit of price anchoring too. I think I think it helped uh, with with sales of it of the standard uh, cheaper bike as yeah. well, which makes makes a lot of sense. The last I one in this, uh, in this- I was gonna say, with toilet paper, it's like people generally know what they want to. It's like, if you're going for the Angel Soft and the Charmin, if 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 you have that single ply, like sandpaper uh, <laughs> right in front of you for a $5 discount, I think people just generally call up the five bucks and say, you know what, I, <laughs> I'm gonna treat myself this time. I'll have, I'll have the nicer stuff. That is certainly my approach when it comes to when it comes to toilet paper. Uh, last one. Uh, there's this trend in e-commerce, particularly among direct-to-consumer brands, uh, toward price transparency, showing customers exactly what the item costs to produce and then what the markup the retailer is charging over that. What do you think of that trend? Uh, do consumers care? Is that kind of transparency actually helpful? I think people have not cared over the last five six years. I think that will become a big trend. Perhaps not on the pricing side of things, but definitely on the quality and the manufacturer side of things. And so um, we're all shopping on open marketplaces these days, uh, just as individual consumers, where the product is coming from, who's really backstopping the quality and the attributes you see. Those are all things that are, are incoming, I think. Um, for example, we're trying to get ahead of that. And so because we write our own software, run our own fulfillment centers, all the food products that you see on box, you'll see an exact expiration date of the item that you're gonna get. Cause we track it all the way throughout the supply chain, but that's just the first step, right? Uh, and so that's just an expiration date. Ideally, we'd be able to track all the way back to, is this, does this have a verified check mark that it's from the manufacturer? What day was it produced? Um, so I do think as online food becomes more and more prevalent uh, in terms of buying behavior, um, you're going to see customers want that same transparency that they get in store. Yeah, and it would seem to me it matters more online, or just or the or the consumer has greater choice um, than in than in the store. You would totally think so, and so I challenge anyone listening to this uh, uh, or watching this: um, go to your favorite food purveyor online and see if they're showing you the expiration dates, and you'll be shocked that they don't. Um, but yet, uh, you're exactly right. You probably shouldn't have the expir expiration date online because you expect it in store. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, well, Jay, this is super helpful. I really appreciate um, your sharing sharing those thoughts. I, I, you know, it's you deal with this. It sounds like constantly, given the the business you're in. But uh, we all, whatever whatever industry you're in, did us constantly face this uh, mix of uh, business strategy and moral decisions to make when it comes to, to pricing and need to feel this out with, uh, appreciate your providing, uh, providing that guidance. Awesome. Thanks. Ed. Have a great one.
And thanks everyone for joining us for this second episode of Make Business Better. We'll be back uh, here uh, right live on LinkedIn next Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, our guest will be Sally Krawcheck, uh, who is the founder and CEO of Elvest, uh, a financial uh, platform uh, geared toward women. And we're going to talk about uh, ESG investing and social impact investing, um, how to make money and do good with those investments at the same time. Uh, if you're interested, following Quartz on LinkedIn is the best way uh, to keep up with this show. You'll be notified whenever we go live. I look forward to seeing you all there. Thanks and have a great rest of the day.